In this worked example, I'm going to show you how you use number counts. So let's say we have a population of objects out in space somewhere. Um, let's say gamma ray bursts, for example, or brown dwarfs or quasars or anything like that. What you want to work out is whether these things, which you don't know the distances for, could be distributed uniformly through space or concentrated near or far from you. What you have here are the fluxes. Let's say we have fluxes of a thousand of these things. So the first one is a flux in whatever units of 1.35, the second one has a flux of 3.88, 1.49, 1.32, and so on and so forth. There's about 50 numbers there, but they will keep on going and going to get to a thousand. Now what you can see is that some are faint. Our limit is one. Anything fainter than one we're not going to see. So there are some that are quite close to the limit. And there are a few that are much brighter than the limit. In principle, there could be ones very, very much brighter, but most of them seem to be fairly close to the limit. Now, what we want to see is whether this distribution of these counts, that is to say the relative number of ones that are very close to your limit, one in this case, and then ones that are much brighter, is consistent with them being uniformly distributed in space. So the first step is to divide these things into bins and count them. So the first bin might be the number of these things with fluxes between one and two. So it's one of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, five, six, seven, and so on. So you'd add up the number with fluxes, say, between 1 and 2. Then you could add up the ones with fluxes between, say, 2 and 3. So that's between 2 and 3, 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 and so on. And there aren't as many of those. Then you could add up the number with between, say, 3 and 4, 4 and 5, etc., etc. And then plot those all, and that will give you a histogram. And here, in fact, is that histogram. So it turns out there are 636 objects in the system, 1,000 with fluxes between 1 and 2, 170 with fluxes between 2 and 3, and so on. And what you can see is the brighter ones are rarer than the common ones, uh, than the faint ones. So the ones that are faint, there are lots of them. The ones that are very bright, say more than nine times, the, nine times the minimum flux, are much fainter. And here are the numbers here, the numbers in each of these bins. Now the bin is a bit arbitrary. Um, you could divide them to smaller bins, so it could be between 1 and 1 1.5, 1.5 and 2, 2, 2, 2.5 and so on, in which case you'd have fewer in each bin, but you probably see the same pattern in rather more detail. If you make the bin smaller, you see more detail, you get a smoother curve, but you have fewer objects in each bin. So when the bins get out here, it starts becoming very noisy because you might only have one or two objects in each bin. So it swings and roundabouts. Pick your bin size so you can see what's going on, um, but not so, uh, not so small that you only have a small number per bin. OK, so what do we do now? What we do now is work out the cumulative number of counts. Back here, we had the number of counts in each bin, but what we really care about is the number brighter than some limit. So the number brighter than a flux of one is the sum of this bin, this bin, this bin, in fact, all the bins, which in this case is a thousand objects. The number with fluxes greater than two is going to be the spin plus that bin plus that bin all added up, and so on. So here I've added it all up. So the number with flux greater than one is a thousand, that's a sample size. The number of fluxes greater than two I've just added up 170 plus 70 plus 39 plus 21 plus all that, and there are a few more up beyond 10 as well that I haven't shown on that graph. And that comes out as 363, and so on. So this is the cumulative number with fluxes greater than some amount. Now, if you remember, I demonstrated that if objects are distributed uniformly in space, this cumulative number should be proportional to the limiting flux to the minus three halves. So whenever you have a proportional two, you can replace that with a constant of proportionality. So that means n equals some unknown constant, f to the minus three over two. And what we want to know is, does that fit these data well? Well, there are lots of ways you can check this. One way would be to say, okay, Let's work out what k is based on this. So let's substitute the number. We know that if f 
limiting flux of one, get a number of thousand. So we know that 1000 equals k 1 to the power of minus 3 halves, which is just 1. So it's 1000 there, so k equals 1000. As we know that, we can then predict what we're going to see for other values. So for example, for flux greater than 2, the number we predict should be equal to 1000 times the limiting flux, in this case 2, 1000 times 2 to the minus 3 over 2. And likewise at 3, 4, 5. So we can calculate all those things. And here is a comparison between those predictions based on that simple equation, which is along here, and the actual number that we saw. And what you can see is it does a pretty good job. So our simple calculation, f to the minus 3 halves predict we should have 354. With fluxes greater than 2, we actually see 363. Close enough. It's very close for 3. Uh, numbers greater than 10, the prediction is a bit higher than we actually see. Uh, for greater than 20, still a bit higher, but not by very much. So overall, it fits pretty well. You have to bear in mind this is a random process. These are the predicted averages, but each individual object is going to be individual. You might fluke out and get a whole bunch of big ones to begin with, or small ones. But overall, the agreement is pretty good. So in this case, I think we can conclude that all those objects whose fluxes we measured really are consistent with being spread uniformly over three-dimensional space.